Cool. Oh, sweet. Can y'all see me okay? <laughs> well, my name is Eric Farmer. I'm with the Tennessee Student Assistance Corporation. We're the ones that administer lottery scholarship to state grants and any other type of state financial aid program you want to use to go to uh, college. Now, I promise you're not going to see me the whole time. I'm only doing this to record, uh, record this and so that I can give it to uh, uh, Mr. Brandon and we can put it on the uh, uh, website and so that if you, anybody who's missed can also uh, see this presentation as well. Um, what I am going to do is start my presentation here. If it's going to let me. There we go. Here. And so what we're going to do is have a financial aid 101 here. So, I gotta stand up here, what's nice, what's nice. Oops, oops. There we go, all right. So, tonight's gonna be a financial aid 101. We're gonna give you the basics of the financial aid uh, program, things about what you'll hear, um, things you'll come across, ideas you might wanna come and uh, think about as you go through this process. Some things have changed this year, and that, um, uh, so things, a lot of things are maybe a little bit earlier than in the past. We've got children that are older, uh, that have already graduated. Things have changed a little, and we'll get to that as well. If you ever have questions, feel free to ask during the presentation, but also this is my contact information. Um, feel free to text me, email me. I'm on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. Um, and actually, as I said, this before this, uh, before this presentation will also be on YouTube. Hopefully the sound is gonna be okay. Um, try to speak loud enough to not only where you can hit, hear me, but also where you can hear me in the back as well. So I hate a mic. Can you hear me okay back there? Can we hear okay over there? Good. Feel free to take pictures. I don't mind. If I see you taking a picture, don't be afraid. Don't be surprised if I do this. As, I take the, as, you, as you take the picture, I do like posing. I am a, uh, what my wife calls, somewhat vain and uh, narcissistic, I guess you can say. Um, I'm going to try to make this as entertaining and informative as possible. Let's let you know financial aid is not the most interesting topic. Um, actually, when I first started doing this, I put myself to sleep doing this presentation. Um, so I'm going to try my best to make this entertaining and uh, informative as well. <clears throat> so here we go. So as you start looking for colleges and looking for the right school, you'll start noticing that the colleges cost different prices. And then you start looking at your own finances and realize you have nothing but pennies comparatively, which might then put you in a panic. So hopefully after tonight, you're not going to be as in, as in much of a panic as uh, before. Uh, I'm not going to say that this, this process is going to be easy. I'm not going to say that this process is, uh, is not going to be stressful. This is a stressful process. Kids, you are, kids, my bad, young adults, <laughs> you are trying to figure out your lifelong career. You know, this is your what I want to do when I grow up moment. And you're, kind of, you're probably thinking, is this what I really want to do? And we'll let you know, there's a lot of a high percentage of people, including myself, will change their major while they're in college. Uh, I changed my major twice before I even stepped foot on a, oh, before I stepped foot in class. I can't say I stepped, on, stepped foot on a college campus. Because the first time I changed the major, I thought I was going to be a doctor. My dad was a doctor. And I was like, man, I'm going to be a doctor. But he kind of noticed that I wasn't doing well in the sciences and math. But he goes, okay, I mean, I want to, you know, just kind of show you something. So he gives me his uh, medical book, one of his medical books. He goes, start reading. I'm okay. I get past the first sentence before I decided, no, this is not what I want to do. I couldn't, I didn't understand, I understand two words in that first sentence, D and O. The rest of them, I was like, I have no clue. And I got to learn this. Yeah, it's Latin. And I'm like, okay, that's it. That's done. I don't want to do Latin. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to be going to computer science because I love computers. I was actually taking a computer science class in high school, and I was a um, sophomore with other juniors and seniors, and I was actually excelling in the class. I was like the number one person in the class as a sophomore, and everybody else was juniors and seniors. And uh, actually ended up going to an uh, engineering and science camp, uh, science, uh, computer science camp, uh, the summer after my sophomore year. So I was taking computer science. Let me tell you what I wanted to do. This is 
late 80s, early 90s, internet wasn't as prevalent as it is now. We didn't have cell phones that you could do all kinds of stuff on it. We didn't have all these different computer viruses. But computer viruses had just started up. There were many, when, when the computer viruses hit, they would hit large corporations. So I would hear this in the news and go, man, I know what I want to do when I grow up. I want to create a program that kills the virus and recalls the data that is lost. Do you realize what I wanted to do? I wanted to be Norton. I wanted to be McAfee. Just imagine if I stuck with it. I wouldn't be here. <laughs> right. It wouldn't be called Norton and McAfee. It would be called Pharma. Okay. <laughs> I actually didn't realize that. That's what that's what I was turning to until a couple years ago. I was like, wait a second. This is exactly this is this, this is virus protection, this protection, things like that. Guess what happened? Walks, walks to register for my courses. I was on Tennessee Tech's campus. I was ready. I was on one computer science, one computer science. It's all Calc one, Calc two, Calc three. I don't want to go to computer science. <laughs> <laughs> it's like what? I can't do that. And uh, so that scared me, and so I ended up going into business, and um, there's more to that story. But it's not, like I said, it's, it's not, it's okay that you're not 100% sure. There's things you can do, there's things you can traverse, there's financial aid out there, but we're, you know, no matter what you want to do, okay? So let's think about the terms, right? So the first term that you'll hear is cost of attendance or COA. That's how much it is to, that, to uh, go to the institution, the total cost. It's not just one aspect of it, it's the total cost. Tuition, room and board fees, books, supplies, travel expenses, personal expenses, the whole nine. The cost of the COA or the cost of attendance at each institution is going to be different. Now, just to let you also know, there's actually two different types of cost of attendance. There's the official cost of attendance that you'll see on the college websites or, them, uh, or in a, some type of publication. And then there's your personal cost of attendance of which you are going to actually pay to go to that school. A lot of times, your personal cost is lower than the official cost, so a lot of times. It's based upon major uh, housing, books, scholarships, grants, loans, things like that that you get, okay? EFC, EFC is the expected family contribution. This is a term that you'll hear when uh, the FAFSA is used. EFC is gonna determine if you qualify for need-based money. The lower your EFC, the better chance of receiving need-based money. Need-based money is the grant money. Um, the, for, the real definition is the EFC is the reasonable amount of money that the family can, is going to contribute to the child's education. That amount can be anywhere from nothing, zero, to $99,999. And you'll see those numbers. You'll see that range maybe on your EFC when you fill out your FAFSA, zero to $99,999. That does not mean that's what you got to pay for your child to go to college. Just look at it as a gauge. The lower the EFC, the better chance of receiving need-based money. Okay. The FAFSA is the free application for federal student aid. I'll say that again. The FAFSA is the free application for federal student aid. The FAFSA is the free application for federal student aid. What does FAFSA stand for? Caught you off guard, huh? <laughs> All right. Yes, free application for the student aid. Why do I say that over and over again? Most important thing. What about that is the most important thing? It is free, okay? Any financial aid that you are applying for should be free. You should have to pay to get money. Now, you'll pay for, uh, for an application fee. And actually, take that back. There is something that you might have to pay for that's a legit but it's a separate financial aid application. FAFSA you don't pay for. Scholarship applications you shouldn't pay for. All right, there is the uh, CSS profile, which is an additional financial aid application. You do that does have a fee to it, but it's a legit fee. All right, that's the only thing I'll say that you do have to pay for that um, you might have to do it. Not every, not every school requires it. If you go to a private school like Vandy, Swanee, um, Rhodes, Fisk, these are the four schools in Tennessee, and other private schools across the country that might use the CSS profile. You'll have to pay some money to fill it out. Because it goes a little more in depth than the FAFSA, but 
it's okay. You know, that is a legit application. Everything else you shouldn't have to pay for. It. Everything else is free. There is a website out there where if you do go to it, you're going to have to pay at least eighty dollars to submit it. Okay, submit the FAFSA. It's FAFSA.com. Do not go to FAFSA.com. Go to FAFSA.gov. That's a free site. However, if you have, if you go to FAFSA.gov and you decide, man, this can't be free. I just feel like I got to pay somebody. My name is Eric Farmer. <laughs> take checks, cash, credit cards. And part of my joke on this was I also take food. <clears throat> I weighed myself this morning. I don't longer take food. <laughs> okay. Next year, hopefully, I'll be a lot smaller. But I saw a little weight up color. Oh, snap. I'm almost <laughs> as big as a car. Holy crap. So no more food unless it's fruits and vegetables. Fruits and vegetables, I take. But anyway, you don't even pay to give me that. Because it is free. Someone just get in. I think someone just logged in. <laughs> All right. So, because I'm live, I'm live. I'm, I'm up on the internet. If someone can, you know, hear me. They might be even t be able to chat with me. Uh, I won't see it. Y'all will see it probably before I will. Anyway, um, it is free. Just remember that you don't have to pay for it. FSA ID, this is how you sign off on your FAFSA. This is how a student needs one, at least one parent in the household needs one. This is done electronically now, so both the student and at least one parent in the household needs one. This is how you sign off on your FAFSA. This is how you recall your FAFSA information. Even later on, this is how you can, uh, if you have a student loan, you can look what kind of student loans you have. There's all kinds of things attached to this built with the federal government. Student aid report is a report of your FAFSA. Everything that you have put on your FAFSA will be in this report. You typically get this report three days after you submit your FAFSA. When you think about financial aid, think of grants, loans, and scholarships. All three are financial aid. Like I said before, you have the grants, which is need-based, and that's when NEFC comes into play. You have the loans, which is money that you borrow that you've got to pay back. And you want to make sure you use the loans as a last resort. When you fill out your FAFSA, you will get a loan. And as of right now, if you're a freshman, you will get $5,500 in loan money. You do not have to take any bit of that. If you need $500, you can take $500 of that. If you only need $2,500, you can only just take $2,500. Or if you need the whole $5,500, you can take the full amount. But you don't have to take it unless you need it. I highly recommend you use that as a last resort. Try to get as much free money as possible, and then take out your loan if you need it. If you need it. Because if you take it out, you got to do what with it? Yeah. Pay it back with interest. Okay. Pay it back with interest. All right. Two of the terms that you'll hear is verification. Verification is an audit on your FAFSA. If you call for verification, they're going to want some documentation. Um, sometimes it's your tax form. Sometimes it's your W-2s. It's not a big deal. This is what I do. And when my wife is going to school, I filled out her, I helped her complete her FAFSA. And we sat there together doing it. And each time, she got called for verification. I was like, okay, this is what I do. I kind of, I'm insulted, but okay. You know, but it's just a random audit. I, you know, we sent our paperwork in and bam, she got her money. If you don't complete your verification process, you don't get financial aid of any type. So if you call for verification, you want to make sure that you get your information in. Now I'm going to let you know a little secret. Once you get your student aid report, look at your EFC on the student aid report. If there's a little asterisk, you know, a little star next to your EFC, you're going to be called for verification. All right, so just know, heads up. But hey, oh, I'm going to be called for verification and be looking for the information that they'll need. Okay. Uh, the work study program is a federal program. There's money set aside by the federal government for your child to work on campus. All right, it's uh, separate money from what the uh, campus employment is. Um, there's going to be a question on your FAFSA that is going to ask if you're interested in the work study program. I suggest you mark yes, even if you're not. It's better to have than need, than need and not have. All right, so if you need it and you mark yes, you're gonna get it and you're, if you qualify for it. If you don't need it and you mark yes and you get it, you can decline it. If you need it and mark nothing or no, you won't get it. Okay. So it's better to need it and it's better to not need it and have it than to need it and not have it. I said it differently earlier. I just, I just messed myself up. 
Um, I don't know. Yes. All right. So, so, so you like your, uh, your tax form, you complete a tax, uh, uh, tax form, maybe your W-2. Um, they might even ask for um, a particular schedule if you're on your own business or something like that. So it's just something dealing with the your doing your taxes. It's rare that they'll ask for your bank statements. Sorry, but the name, the name is going to be dealing with your, your, your tax information. Yes, ma'am. Now, just do the, the year that you use to complete your fast, and you'll understand why I said it that way instead of the previous year. That's the change I'm going to say. That's the change on the fast. It used to be the previous year, not that anymore. So, oh, that's nice. <laughs> that popped up on its own, didn't it? Did someone just do it? Like, did all of a sudden it disappeared? That's funny. Okay. <laughs> so the person walked in probably did it. That's awesome. Um, <laughs> you know, a lot of crap. That's awesome. Um, so, oh, you know what I did? Let's see. Let's try that again. I shared my screen, so wh whoever's on can do whatever. Okay. So when you think about cost of attendance, there's the direct cost, and the direct cost is your tuition, room and board, and fees, and then you have indirect costs, which are book supplies, uh, book supplies, travel expenses, personal expenses. When you think about going to college and you think about your cost of attendance, this is what you need to think about. A lot of times, students stop here. They go, sweet, tuition is paid, I'm going to college. They forget the rest. I used to work at Tennessee Tech University and I had someone come in my office and says, I have no money for books, food, or how to get back home. And I'm like, I can't do nothing for you. You know, did you, I mean, did you already take out your loans or things like that? I said, go talk to financial aid office. I mean, I was at a loss. Because how'd you get up here? You know, the reason why you're here is to so what? Learn. You at least need that. <laughs> you know, I can see your parents drop you off and not give you money to come back home. <laughs> I can see that. And they said I had everything, I have money for everything except for travel, uh, getting back home money. I'm like, they, they did that on purpose. You know, don't even worry about that. Can you live up here? You got a meal plan? Yeah, I'll do it. Okay. They're good. You know. But just think about the whole cost, all right? So when you think about the cost, you don't know where to start. Look at the, the website of the different colleges. They have to have this information up there. And this is actually information from the actual legit uh, uh, colleges. Community college, a four-year private, and a, uh, a four-year public, and a four-year private. Um, now, this data is actually maybe a year or so old, but this is information I did get from those, those different websites. Um, the first one is the community college is Chattanooga State. That's not a misprint at the very bottom of $16,000. That is their official cost of attendance. Now, that is not your cost. So let's say you live in Chattanooga and you decided, I am not, uh, oh, okay. Let's say you live in Chattanooga and you decided you're gonna live in an apartment. That could be your cost. But let's say you decide to live at home you no longer are going to have that cost. So your cost has now gone down about seven thousand dollars. Let's say you said I'm going to get, I'm going to commute with my parents. They have to drive past Chess State anyway. I'm just going to hop in the car when they leave in the morning to go to my class, or they get off and hop in the car again. You have just decreased your transportation costs. So that's how you kind of figure out your cost for tenants to figure to figure out how much it's going to cost you. That's their official cost, but what is it going to cost you? By you can kind of vary it up and figure out, hey, what I'm going to pay in tuition, what I'm going to do in my dorm rooms, how much about my books are going to be, what kind of cost do I have? I mean, ladies, you're, you know, young women, y'all like to shop, right? Okay, there's, at least one, there's only one person admitted that they like to shop, okay? I'm a fella, I like to shop. Yeah. Um, that's something you got to think about. Wherever you go, you got to think, hey, I want some new stuff, periodically. You know, I'm going to go to, what college do you want to go to? 
I want to go to MTSU. I want MTSU swag. I saw this cute sweatshirt. I want to get it. You know, what college do you want to go to? Don't know. I, I'm going to go to, I don't know college. I want, I don't know university. Well, you know, that's what you got to think about. I see that with a Bama shirt back there. Hey, if I go to Tuscaloosa, that's even a higher cost. I want new Bama swag. You know, I'm going to go to a school in Florida. What's the temperature like in Florida? Hot. Terror than it is here. It's hot here, but it's hotter there. You're going to need more glow. I want to go to NYU. What's the temperature like up there? That's New York University, by the way. <laughs> Cold, all right? You got to think about that as well, okay? So, once you figure out your cost, you got to come up with a package to cover your cost. And that package will come from the federal government, your state, the private sources and institutions themselves to cover that cost. When you start looking at the institutions, they have different types of uh, financial aid. They have academic scholarships, they have need-based scholarships, they have performance scholarships, they have attribute scholarships as well. But what you want to do, even though a lot of institutions have one application to fill out and apply for all this, you still want to search it to kind of see what you might qualify for to kind of give you an idea of what you might be able to get or what money you can get from that institution. Now, there's private sources, there's private uh, financial aid, private scholarships. Where's the first place you look? First place you look? School counseling. Who's your school counseling? It's rent, all right? Go here and say, hey, I need money. Where's your scholarship list? I want some college. Is there any juniors in here? Juniors, junior, same thing. Early. What's the scholarship I can apply for next year? And just start writing the list down. Seniors, start applying now. It's time. It's crunch, you know. It's this. You're back. In, I know you just got back in school not too long ago. You're like, man, I already got to start thinking about college. Yes, it's that time. Also, look at scholarship databases and scholarship search engines. You got FastWeb, you got collegeforteen.org, you got um, CapEx, you got uh, scholarship.com. There's all these different databases that you can actually go to and find scholarships or private scholarships out there. If you decide to go to one of those routes, you know, FastWeb is the most, one of the most popular ones. You want to make sure that you have a secondary email account. This is just my, my experience. Right? Get a secondary email account because if you use your primary one, it's going to get inundated with emails from FastWeb. All right. So you get inundated with emails from FastWeb. I did this when I first started working with, uh, with TSAC with my son, and he was a sophomore at the time. Within the first week, I got over 50 emails from FastWeb. This is now 2016. He no longer is in school. Um, he is now 22 years old. I still get emails periodically about his, him qualifying for scholarships from FAFSA. All right. Coming to my personal email account. So definitely want to set this up a secondary. Also, speaking of emails, students, listen close. Change your email if it's not professional. Or use a different one. Make sure you got to know that it's not professional. You know, colleges, you think, even though you don't want them to think, you think they don't do this, they do this. They will judge you based upon what they see on that application. So if you have twerk queen, sexy mama, <laughs> you know, make it rain, eat my dust, whatever, you know, whip, nay, nay, right, whatever. You want to change that, okay? Have a professional one to use put on your applications, uh, scholarship applications, admissions applications, even job applications. I use the same one for all that. Um, make it more professional. It could be your, your name and some numbers, or it's like mine is my full name. You know, so make it more professional, okay? So, the fast one. This is what I was talking about earlier. This is the change. This year, you can submit your, you can uh, actually fill out your fast one for the first time in October. October of this year. In the past, it's always been January. This year is going to be in October. So you're filling out the 1718 FAFSA. This is a little different than before in the fact that, uh, well, let me, I want to get ahead of myself. Students and parents got to have a valid social. You also have to register with the uh, FSA, get an FSA ID, the student, at least one parent in the household. It is 
The change is where, what taxi are we using? So in the past, you go one previous year back, like you said. So this one, you know, there's one, there's the seniors, this past year that just graduated, filled out the 16-17 uh, FAFSA, they used 2015 information. From this point forward, you're going two years back. So this is the 17-18 FAFSA, you're using 2015 information. Okay. Next year when you fill out the 18-19 FAFSA, you're using 2016, so you're going two years back. The reason why they're doing this is they're going to try to let you use the IRS data retrieval. They also figured out your income doesn't change much between two years. Now, if it, if there is a change. You're still going to use that tax information from that year. But you're also going to let the financial aid office know that there's been an income change. All right. So go ahead and fill it out. Use that tax information, but also notify the financial aid office, hey, I don't make as much as I did in 2015. And they'll, they'll be able to adjust it. Um, the reason for the change now is that you go ahead. Oh, that's okay. No, okay, so good question. So is the FSA ID the same thing that you did six years ago, which is the 10, and it's not. It's two different things. However, if you do remember, if you do have a PIN number and you go to, uh, to register your FSA ID, it will eventually ask you, do you want to marry your PIN information with your FSA ID information, which is good, and then you can say yes, then it's going to ask for your PIN. So if you know your PIN, and everything will marry. So the next screen that was in marriage is already pre-populated. And you don't have to go through the uh, social security verification and everything is gonna be immediate, right? Good question. So the certainty now with your tax information, you don't have to actually um, estimate and then come back. Uh, you can actually pull that information directly from the IRS into your FASPA, so less typing. You gotta do, you only have to do it once now. So it's going to be a little bit easier. Um, you'll be able to, uh, it'll be less pressure for the uh, deadlines from the state schools, state and the schools. So you're getting everything in around the same time. You have scholarships coming in at the same time. You have faster information coming at the same time. So that's going to have to give you a better opportunity to make a better decision. Instead of going, okay, I got my scholarship in, in, in the fall, I got to do my FAFSA in the spring, and now I got to wait to see my FAFSA data in order for me to decide what information, what I want to be able to do. Well, this time, everything should be coming back to you around the same time. And so therefore, you'll be able to make a better decision about what, uh, cost-wise, of what institution you might be able to afford, okay? It's kind of giving you an idea how this improves and how it helps us, it helps us everybody. This kind of gives you the uh, deadline dates and how many days they had to fill out the different applications. And so for um, the Promise and the TSEA and the Hope Scholarship, the 2016-17 deadlines for Promise for the FAST was, was February 16th, February 15th, I'm going to The uh, TSEA was uh, March 1st and the Hope was September 1st. Hope, Hope was always going to be September 1st. But from the time of the application opened to the time that the deadline was, the students for Promise only had 46 days to complete their FAST last year. For TSA, they had 61 days, and for Hope, they had 245 days. This year, because you can do it in October, the deadline date for what promise at TSA is the same. We both have 109 days. So it's less pressure to get that in. It's quicker. You have a little bit more time to get that in. You don't have to rush and go, ah, oh, I didn't have no more. You know, if you go, oh, I'm going to get this in. This is what happens. I have time to fix it. I'm a little more at ease. You know, and plus with the Hope, you almost have a full year. Now, I don't think that the Hope deadline is all important because if you're going to FAFSA anyway, the application for the Hope is FAFSA, so whatever. Yeah. Uh, it's the TSA and the Promise deadline, so it's, it's more, more important. Um, blah, 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 let's get this, blah, blah. Oh, let me actually go back to this. So, in order to fill out the FAFSA, you have to have a valid social or be an eligible non citizen. And this screen shows all the eligible non-citizens. It's status. If you really want this, I can send this presentation to you so that you can have it. But I'm letting you know if you have a social, a legal social, you can follow fast. If you have a deferred action 
social, you will not be able to fill out the FAFSA. Actually, the back. You can fill it out, but your FAFSA is going to be invalid. Okay. And that's what, if you have that type of social, it's going to be an invalid FAFSA. You have to have an actual social, social security number and a legal citizen or an uh, eligible non citizen. Who qualifies as my parents? So in the FAFSA, you got to answer these dependency questions. Um, or actually, do I put my parents' information on the FAFSA? So you got to be 24 or older, and we actually talked about this earlier. Uh, married, going for your master's or doctor, which none of y'all are. Armed forces, veteran, children, um, and you're, you, you have children, and they're receiving a, uh, half support from you. Uh, since you turned the age of 13, both your parents are deceased in foster care at the ward of the court, you're emancipated, and if you got to ask what emancipated is, you are not. Um, legal guardianship means someone other than your parents or bi uh, biological parents or adoptive parents have custody of you. And then if you're an unaccompanied minor who's homeless, these are all questions that you'll answer on your FAFSA. If you answer yes to any of those, you do not have to put your parents' information in there. However, the school is going to want you proof of whatever you marked yes. Okay. Now, who's considered my parents? These are not your parents. Okay, so if you live with grandma, don't put grandma's information on there, unless she's adopted. If you live with brother and sister, don't put your brother and sister information on there, unless they adopted you. If you live with foster parents, and then they adopt you, that's the only time you put that in there. But if you live with foster parents, it's a whole other category. If you live with someone who's got legal guardianship on you, you don't put their information in there. You're considered an independent student. All right. If you have questions about that, I'll, that I'll be standing up here afterwards, and I can answer the questions, those questions for you. So when you do fill out your FSA ID, this type of information they're going to ask for, they technically are going to only require you to, to complete or have a username and password. Okay, technically. I highly recommend you put an email address on there as well. Because you can use your email address or your username. You can use your email address as your username if you need, if you like. Also, if you forget your password or forget information, it can be sent to the email address. And it's able for, it's easier for you to recall it and it's a, less, a lot less hassle. Um, what I want you to also think about was as you do this, and by the way, you can go ahead and register with the FSA ID now. But you can have it. If you want this to write it down, I can send this to you as well. Okay, well, that way you can have this to print up and write everything down and make sure you have everything. Now, I don't normally tell people to write their information down, but with the last couple of years we've had to do this, how, I don't hate to say the students will forget their stuff, you might want to write it down. Um, you also want to definitely use the show text box. The show text box is actually allow you to see what you type in your password, and actually I've done this myself. Where you're so used to writing the type in a password a certain way, and you accidentally hit the wrong, I said the wrong number. I've done it before, where I put the wrong number actually twice, and it's all starred, so I don't even know it. And so when I go back to log back in, I can't. So if you should see the show text, you actually can see what you type again. Um, you've got to know your social security number. And students, if you don't know your social security number by heart, this is your homework assignment for the rest of this week. Memorize it. This number you'll need from this point forward. You'll need to know it from this point forward. Anytime you fill out an application for college, scholarships, job, it's going to ask for that. Insurance, it's going to ask for that. So memorize it. Then you use date of birth, first, middle, last name. It's got security questions. The first two, so from a drop, drop down box, you just select one and then uh, put in the answer. The next two, you've got to create the question and answer. You cannot be, let's see, you cannot put this, the same answer twice. In other words, if you want to be smart about it and just select things at random and type in a random question and then put, what's the answer here? Rebels, rebels. You want to put rebels for all four, it's not going to work. So you got to actually answer each one individually. And then the last one, you got to come up with a significant date that can't be your birthday. Now, to me, 
That's a hard question for a high school senior. All right. I have significant dates. My wedding date, birth of my grandchildren, stuff like that. You know, I have significant dates. High school students like, what's the significant date other than my birthday? Graduation day, prom day, mom and dad's birthday, those are significant. Don't put your boyfriend or girlfriend's birthday. I will tell you why. They might not be your boyfriend or girlfriend after you fill this out. Okay, I'm gonna be honest with you. All right, you probably heard this before. You go off to college, you see a whole nother group of people. Okay, you see a whole nother group of people. I just got some looks like <laughs> my man will never leave me. Okay, it's not him I'm worried about. It's not you I'm worried about. It's him. Girls go up there and you know, guys are shy, so we're not gonna really say nothing, but you can have a good time. Life, life, perfectly <laughs> nice plan. Alright, so don't put your, your significant others date there. Graduation date, prom date, mother's birthday, father's birthday, something like that. If you have issues, you contact that 800 number, or you call me, email me, tell me tell me you have uh, Issues with your uh, uh, FAFSA or your FSA ID. We actually have to set a date for me to come here and help you with your uh, FAFSA, which is no well, November 10th from 2 to 6. No, it? It's 2 to 6. From 2 to 6 on November 10th. So I'll actually be here to help you complete your FAFSA. November 10th from 2 to 6. Um, Parents do not have a valid social. You still have to put your information on your FAFSA if uh, the uh, student is not an uh, independent student. If you don't have a social, you just put all zeros, and um, you will not be able to make create an FSA ID. So you'll have to actually print out the signature page at the end and actually physically sign off on your FAFSA. And so when that happens, when you get to the very end, they'll say print off the signature page. You'll click on that. It'll open another window for you to print out the actual this actual page that has. Uh, parent signature or parent number, whatever signature with the social, you'll sign it. It's got an, uh, a place where you su submit it or send it, and you'll just mail it off that way. Uh, when you do fill out your FAFSA, this is what you're applying for. You're applying for the Hope Scholarship. Now, at a two year school, the amounts have changed. Uh, actually, the Hope Scholarship amounts have changed across the board. Uh, at a two year school, if you qualify for the Hope Scholarship, it's $1,500 per semester. And you have to have a uh, 21 ACT score or a 3.0 GPA. So either or, you're hope eligible. If you have a 29 ACT score and a 375 GPA, you get the first supplement, which is the GAMS, and that's going to be $500 on top of what you get for the hope. If your adjusted gross income is 36000 or less, you get something called the Aspire, and it's $250 per semester on top of the hope scholarship. Now, unfortunately, if you qualify both for both GAMS and Aspire, you only get one. In this case, you'll get the GAMS, because that's the most amount. But let's say you decide to go to a four year institution. The amounts, the qualifications are the same, the amounts change. Okay? So, if you're going to a four year institution and you're going in classified as a freshman or sophomore, it's $17.50 per semester. You classified as a junior or senior, it's $22.50 per semester. Listen to the words. It's based upon classifications. If you're classified as a freshman or sophomore, $17.50 per semester. Classified as a junior or senior, twenty-two fifty per semester. Let's look at this. Let's say you're taking dual enrollment courses. You've taken enough to get your first year out the way, so you go in as a sophomore. If you go in as a sophomore, you're getting seventeen fifty per that per semester for the hope. But that means you're almost a full year ahead of someone else who has no dual enrollment. So you're, you're going to have one year less of the seventeen fifty and one year more of the twenty-two fifty. Let's say you're really advantageous and you graduate your, uh, with uh, your associate's degree uh, at the same time as you graduate with your high school diploma. You go in as a junior. So the day one that you step on campus, you're getting $22.50 per semester. Now, in either of those cases, you still have the full time to use your health scholarship. You still have five years, you still have 120 credit hours, or your bachelor's degree, whichever comes first, to use the health scholarship. Even if you have an associate's degree, you still have five years to use it. Okay. Questions? 
So for GAMS, same requirement, same amount. For Aspire, same requirement, $500 more. And in this case, once again, you can't qualify for both. If you qualify for both, you only get one. In this case, you're getting the Aspire. Uh, some other programs we have with Hope Access, the Water and Nature Technical Skills Grant, which is that automatic $2,000 to go to the TCAP, and then you have the Tennessee Student Assistance Award, which is uh, our state grant. You have to have an EFC between zero and 2100 in order to qualify for this. Depending on what type of school that you go to, it depends on how much you get. So if you go to a TCAP, it's $1,000. If you go to a community college, it's $1,300. If you go to a state for your institution, it's $2,000 per year. And then at a private institution, uh, like uh, Swanee, Vanderbilt, the university, $4,000 per year. The Tennessee Receipt Promise, here's the checklist. And actually, we also have the checklist uh, was handed out to you as well. Um, the application is open right now. So you go to TennesseePromise.gov. It's a two-step process. How many of y'all actually have uh, done dual enrollment classes before? And paid for the dual enrollment grant? Raise your hand high. Okay, so if you've done the dual enrollment grant, You've already done the first part of the process. All you have to do is log back into your TSAC student portal, click on apply for scholarships, and find the Tennessee Promise Scholarship, click on it, and fill it out and fill it out. If you never, if you don't have a TSAC um, student portal account, you go to that site, you click on create an account, it's going to take you to the TSAC student portal account, you'll create the account, and then it'll just say in red letters, you created your account, you have not applied for anything. Please log back in to apply. You gotta log back in. Once you log in, you click on apply for scholarships and then find the Tennessee Promise link at the very bottom. And that's when you click on uh, apply for the Tennessee Promise. Okay. Remember, it's a two step process. Create the account for the TSAC student portal, log in back in, and apply for the scholarship. Okay. You got to complete your FAFSA by January 17th. It opens up again on October 1st. You go to FAFSA.gov. You have two mandatory, mandatory means that you have to attend. Both of them will be here at the school. You have eight hours of community service that you have to do. You have from November 2nd to July 1st. And then if you're selected for verification, remember, a bunch of FAFSA gets student aid report. It's got an asterisk. You'll know if you're going to be selected for verification. You have until July, July 15th of 2017 to get that information back to the institution. You do all this, you're Tennessee Promise eligible. Now, this is how Tennessee Promise works. It's a last dollar tuition and mandatory fee scholarship for the community college or Tennessee College of Applied Technology. This example is going to show the community college portion. So it's a last dollar after the Hope Scholarship, the state grant, the TSAA, and the federal Pell grant. So we have three students. First student is getting $8,000 in these three funds. Tuition, at the community college, in this example, is four thousand dollars. That covers the tuition. Therefore, promise doesn't kick in at all. Yet, the student pays nothing for tu for tuition. Okay. Student B is getting the Hope Scholarship at the community college, yeah, and that's it. So there's a thousand dollar gap between what he's getting out of those three those three programs and tuition. Promise comes to a thousand. Student still pays nothing for tuition. Student C is getting nothing out of those three programs. So the full four thousand dollar gap. Promise kicks in the full four thousand. The student still pays nothing for tuition. Okay. Questions? Yes. So that doesn't cover all the books. No. No. As I said earlier, it's important to know. There's several parts of this. That's just tuition and mandatory fees. You still got to come up with books, supplies, transportation, spirits, and other stuff. Yeah. Um, I have a question about tuition. Okay. Is that a payment that you have in the or is there a list? It's easy. Okay, so you're talking about the community service and where you, have, where you have to do it. It's easier for me to say this. You can do any community service as long as it doesn't directly benefit your family, it's not directly for your family, and you don't get paid for it. You can also do job shadowing as community service. Also, if you're already in an organization that does community service, as long as that community service with that organization is done after you know, from November 2nd to July 1st, 
that community service will also count Tennessee Promise as well. So you don't have to do double. If you're doing Tennessee Scholars, does anybody need Tennessee Scholars? Yeah. So if you're doing Tennessee Scholars, you've got 80 hours of community service you got to do with them. Well, if you're doing it part of the 80 hours with them, you only need to eight with us, it will double up. So this is us. This is what we do. The outreach we go across the whole state of Tennessee. I'm in the I'm number five there. It's my ten county territory. But you guys should get, you know, even though Felicia over here says number one, we got the number one outreach specialist. So, you know, um, if you have any questions or whatever, feel free to contact me. I do not mind. So my contact information, if you want this presentation in a PDF format, I can give it to you. This presentation will also will be uh, on YouTube, and I'll give uh, Mr. Brandon a lead um, as well. If everything turned out okay with my recording, um, but definitely if you need this one, this presentation in a PDF format, I can also well, send you an email saying, please send me the presentation and I'll get it to you. Also send it, get it to Mr. Brandon as well. It'll be, it'll be on the website. Any questions? If you got questions, you just want to ask them, I'm going to be here standing around, uh, hanging out for a minute. Also, I have my business cards up here if you uh, want to get one as well. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Hey, don't leave, don't leave. I'm a <laughs> we thank Mr. Farmer for giving you that information. Um, I will be in the classroom next week. Um, coach has room on Monday. Um, Mr. Chris room on Tuesday. Um, Jackson and Fraser room.